Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 13, going out on February 25th, 2019. Just to be clear, this podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers people who are serious about building and maintaining a writing career. The Red Sneaker Center is all about providing practical knowledge and advice to help you do just that. The interview for this episode is with Dave Chesson, the famed Kindlepreneur. He is an extremely successful author, online marketer, and the brains behind KDP Rocket, which I have heard people call the single most indispensable tool in the modern-day author's tool belt. We'll also have some writing tips, but before that, the news. Two big stories I wanted to talk about in this news update, one pertaining to Amazon and the other pertaining to Stephen King. And if you're having trouble identifying either of those, you are probably listening to the wrong podcast. First, with respect to Amazon, the news is that for the first time ever, Amazon appears to have bought the adaptation rights for one of its own books. And when I talk about its own books, I'm not talking about books that are sold by Amazon, which of course would be virtually every book, but indeed books that are published by Amazon. As most of you probably know, Amazon has its own publishing entity called Amazon Publishing, and they have imprints in virtually every field of writing imaginable. For instance, Thomas and Mercer is their imprint for publishing thrillers. This story pertains to a new entry in its original collection series, a book called The Fairer Sex, by Michelle Miller, which is actually a collection of eight short stories, romance stories, that they released in connection with Valentine's Day. What's interesting here is that Amazon is, yes, publishing the stories, but Amazon Studios has acquired the media rights for the series. Now, as you probably also know, Amazon Studios has made themselves a significant player in the field of movie and television production. They had a big success a year or so back with a show called Moonlight, which eventually became the film selected for the Best Picture Oscar. Well, they're at it again with this collection, which, according to its official description, is all about, quote, portraits of women figuring out how to make it in the world and get some satisfaction while they're at it. If you want to check this out, you can for people who are in Amazon Prime or Kindle Unlimited, it's completely free, and it's not expensive in any case. But the point is, Amazon, as a publishing alternative, just became far more interesting. We've had an ongoing you know, uh, controversy, should I go with traditional publishing, what some people think of as the old guard publishers, which indeed has its advantages, particularly when it comes to getting books placed in bookstores. But there are also obviously advantages to some of these new wave publishers like Amazon, which obviously has an edge when it comes to selling your book at the place where more than 50% of all books are sold in the United States, and now has an edge when it comes to having your project developed into some kind of movie or TV project. Other publishers have tried this. Random House, for instance, a publisher I was published with for many years, has tried to set up a division to develop books into film projects, but has not had much success. Amazon, I think we can anticipate, will be pushing harder, especially since they've got their their own app and Prime and all kinds of movies and TV shows being released on it all the time. They're not the first to do this. I talked in a previous podcast about Wattpad, which has unveiled Wattpad books to publish their own books and has previously had many film and TV projects. Spotify just picked up some podcast studios, presumably to develop its own pipeline of intellectual property that could be turned into film or TV This is the focus of the new wave. And for the Red Sneaker writer, I think 
this is one more important factor you need to consider when you're deciding where you want to publish. I have to say one other thing that I think is wonderful about this story, though, and that is the increased viability of short stories. I mean, I don't know how they're going to turn eight short stories into a series of any kind. Are they going to pick one and make it a movie? Are they going to do an eight-part anthology series where each episode focuses on a different story? But I, I don't know, but I think it's great. In the past, I've had to tell students sometimes in my writing seminars or the summer writing retreats that, you know, short stories are a tough sell. To me, a short story is about as hard to write as a novel, except I don't know where to go with it afterwards. Amazon has changed that to a large extent with things like this original collection series, or you can publish a short story as a standalone entity, sell the story for 99 cents or whatever. And, and they've made short stories much more viable than they have been in the past. Okay, now the story about Stephen King. He is an author of many firsts, but now the new first achievement for Stephen King is that he is the first author to have his own Alexa skill. Those of you who have something like Amazon's Alexa in your home know exactly what I'm talking about. You select the app on your phone or the skill, they're called, and activate it, and then you can use it anytime you're in the room with one of your Alexa devices. Alexa, open Stephen King Lending Library, and here's what you get, his own app which basically is all about promoting his work because, you know, otherwise he might be too obscure and people might have never heard of the poor guy. Anyway, uh, with this new app, it basically asks you a series of questions. Do you prefer this or that? And after you've gone through the questions, it makes a recommendation about what it thinks you might be interested in reading or hearing. And of course, since this is an Amazon Alexa product, it can hook you up with the Kindle version of that book pretty quickly or the audiobook. Because of course you can stream audiobooks on your Alexa device. You can be listening to them in the morning when you're shaving or brushing your teeth or listening to them at night and uh, try and turn some of that otherwise you know, dead time when you might actually think or <laughs> plot out your next chapter in your book, you can listen to one of these Amazon skills. I know at our house, we frequently listen in, listen to the flash briefing to tell us what's going on in the world. I usually will play Jeopardy in the morning just to warm up my brain and remind myself how much I've forgotten. Well, now you can listen to an author, and I bet he is the first of many that will have an app. I say that because I think this is a super cool idea, so don't be surprised if at some point in the future I'm telling you about the William Bernhardt app. It's probably going to happen. I don't know if my app will have as much creepy music as the Stephen King one does, but you know, this is just another way of getting your work in front of people in the modern age when people are... To a much smaller degree, going out to brick-and-mortar stores, bookstores, and chain stores and whatnot, but spending much more time with their devices and their screens, and now these AI devices like Amazon's Alexa or the Google Home device. This is a new forefront, and I bet you'll be seeing more of this in the future. In the writing tips segment for this podcast, I want to discuss a subject which is one of the more unpleasant topics writers can discuss, but one I think we need to talk about, especially now because it's become the forefront uh, of an ongoing heated discussion in the real world, and that is the topic of plagiarism. Two stories have arisen, giving more controversy than you usually find in the world of books and publishing. Uh, and, and and it's interesting to me, too, because they're, they're, it's not only two at once, but two different kinds of plagiarism. One, the plagiarism of words, and the other, the plagiarism idea of ideas. You may have heard about the controversy surrounding Jill Abramson, who is a very experienced, respected journalist, and her new book, The Merchants of Truth. The accusation, well, to be fair, she's acknowledged that she made mistakes uh, in that portions of other books are quoted 
not in quotation marks and not with footnotes or other kinds of attribution attributions. She says it was an error and I don't doubt it. I've written nonfiction before myself and it's a headache trying to make sure you quote things correctly, put in the quotation marks, give the proper attribution. I'm not making excuses or saying that it was okay to do this, but I am saying I understand how it could happen and I don't doubt that it was inadvertent. She's way too prominent and successful to do something like this just, you know, intentionally. The irony, of course, is that this whole book is about how the news media has been disrupted over the past 10 years or so, leading to this erosion of trust, particularly in the United States, in the media. What she specifically talked about at one point in the book is the uh, erosion, or in some cases, the complete elimination of fact-checking. Her point is that distinguished news sources like the Washington Post or the New York Times will fact-check their stories or will fact-check check anything a politician, like, of course, President Trump says, but other hipper, newer, more modern news agencies like BuzzFeed or Vice Media may not do as much fact-checking, which allows them to break the story faster, which may be of advantage when you're appealing to younger uh, re- younger readers, I guess, who are, are, wa- are reading on their phones or other devices, but may lead to inaccuracy. Well, when that's the subject of your book, you really don't want any, any uh, problems with Uh, with fact-checking in your book, but clearly somebody did not do the job of checking to make sure all the sources were given their proper attribution. The other author involved in a controversy is Dan Mallory, who has a new book out called The Woman in the Window, which is fiction. And the accusation here is not that he's stolen literal words from another source, but rather that he has basically barred the plot. Uh, He has acknowledged being inspired by recent big hits like Gone Girl and The Girl on the Train. He's even acknowledged a debt to the famous Hitchcock film Rear Window. But some people are saying that it goes beyond that. They're particularly concerned about significant plot parallels between The Woman in the Window and a previous thriller called Saving April. Uh, The parallels, to be fair, are significant. Both of the novels feature essentially angst-ridden, middle-aged women who don't want to leave their homes and witness something suspicious while they're spying on their neighbors. That's the rear window aspect of the things. The stories have very similar, some would say identical, plot twists at the end of the book. Quoting from an Amazon review, It is the exact same plot, like down to the main character's backstory. Sorry, but there's no way the amount of stolen material is a coincidence, end quote. Well, I don't know if it is. I've seen weirder coincidences before, but it's disturbing. And Mr. Mallory has not made it any better by saying in old interviews that have been unearthed that good artists steal... Uh, bad artists borrow and things like that, which basically seem to suggest that it's okay to lift things from other writers. Well, here's what I think about that red sneaker writers. In the first place, it's probably not going to help him hurt him very much. The book's selling well. It's already been uh, filmed and the, the film starring Amy Adams is apparently coming out this fall. It is true that some plot archetypes recur. Uh, You know, thrillers usually involve somebody who's thrust in a heap of trouble and things get worse and worse and worse until finally at the climax they get better. Romance novels usually revolve around people who meet, like each other, but for there are obstacles that prevent them from getting together until finally at the end they finally do. We understand plot archetypes. That's what Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey is 